We're in this uh, series on choices, and uh, we're going to talk to you this morning about time in your life from a biblical perspective. Now, we understand racing, and uh, we understand that we talk in language of qualified, qualifying time when we're talking about racing, car racing, qualifying time in regard to marathons and all those kinds of things. And then there's the qualifying uh, time and the clock that the NFL is experiencing right now as we get down to the wire of the playoffs. Go Chiefs, right? Oh, well, one or two of you, I guess the rest of you. I don't know where you come out at, but the qualifying time. I read recently about a uh, young lady by the name of Cindy who was trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon. And uh, so she began to post motivational uh, photos on Instagram and Facebook chronicling chronicling all the miles that she had uh, run in preparing for this big race. And she decided to go for the New York Marathon first, and so she ran that race. She ran the race, and she did it in record time, three hours, 17 minutes, and 29 seconds, a lot faster than her previous half marathons, which usually took about two hours. And then she posted on her Facebook and her Instagram, and she posted this, these words, ran my heart out today and left everything on the course. All the training is paid off, and I qualified for the Boston Marathon. She was all excited, had a selfie had the photos to prove it all, and she was even standing in the winner's circle with the, with the medal as one of the finishers of the New York Marathon, ready for the Boston Marathon. But about 640 miles away, a man sat at his computer and was thinking to himself, that's an incredible time that just seems to be a little bit too incredible. He's made himself famous as a marathoner and a business analyst, but even more famous for exposing the cheats in marathons. And as he sat at the computer, he began to go back to all the personal records and the pictures in the New York races to see if he could find this little petite, brunette-haired little gal, Cindy, who was claiming to have been in that race. Well, he never did find the little petite brunette hair, little gal that was running, but he did find a very strong, tall, athletic-built man who was wearing her bib number in the race. And uh, Murphy went on to talk about that Cindy, who had run the half marathon times in in the New York Marathon process and preparation, discovered that Cindy had never really ever even ran the race, and she was disqualified. I didn't know this, but Murphy uh, has made a profession out of this, and it's not uncommon to have up to 30 individuals who have cheated in some way trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon. Some of them use bribes. Some of them have tried to use the bibs as Cindy did, and others have have done other things, cheating in the marathon in many, many forms by cutting off miles in the qualifying race. And when you think about it, I doubt any of us would do something like that in a marathon because most of us probably wouldn't run a marathon. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) me neither. I couldn't even make the half. But when we talk about qualifying time and we begin to apply it to life, I wonder how many of us who are running the race that is set before us, seeking to qualify the time in our lives, I wonder how many of us qualify time in our thinking, hoping and pretending that something is happening in our lives that counts for something and that counts for eternity And yet the reality is we don't have the right perception and we wouldn't overtly cheat, but we rob ourselves of God's perspective on time. And we end up marking time off rather than making time. And we end up using or killing time and don't realize the effect that it has 
not only ourselves, but the kingdom. As I've thought about this, there are two words in the New Testament, two Greek words that the Bible uses to talk about the way you use your time. And I want, to, I want to spend a little moment in several of these passages, and today I, I want to share a message a little bit different. I'm not going to sink myself in one passage. I, I, want, I want to take a broad spectrum of Scripture, and you be the judge and check me out this afternoon to see that I kept it in context, but I think it is in the context. But I want you to see how the Bible uses time, and I want to share with you some examples out of the life of Jesus and some others in the Scripture as we look at this qualifying time in our lives. One of, the, one of the passages that marks this very clearly is Acts chapter 1, verse 7, in which Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. He has resurrected from the dead after being crucified on the cross for the salvation of humankind. And he's preparing to go, and the disciples are wanting to know what the future is. They want to know what time it is. They want to know what's going to happen. They, they want Jesus to predict. They're, they're all upset about what has happened. They're not sure what to do with the resurrection. Jesus is getting ready to go back again. And they want to know when the world's going to end and when it's all going to... And they want to know all the details. And you remember Jesus had this little conversation with them. And in verse 7, he said to them, in the middle of this little conversation... It is not for you to know the times or the epics. Highlight that in your, in your Apple phone or circle it in your Bible or whatever you, whatever, however you mark. The times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. There's two words here. There's the word kairos, which is the word translated in, in this particular translation, epics. And kairos doesn't have anything to do with the chronological clock that you use. It has everything to do with seasons and epics and the way in which we measure a period of time without reference to the calendar or without reference to the minutes or the hours. But then Jesus used the word chronos, which has everything to do with the clock. It has to do with minutes and hours and days and weeks and ways in which we mark the time in our lives. And Jesus said to the disciples in this particular context, it's not for you to know all the seasons or the epics or to know all of the minutes and the hours that God's put. In fact, not even the Son of Man knows everything about when I'm going to come back again, only the Father. And so there's this very clear difference of understanding time that we see in the Scripture and we find this again several places. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul put it this way when he was talking about the coming of Christ as a birth, at birth as a baby. We just celebrated Christmas. And here's how Paul described that. When the fullness of time, chronos. In other words, when it all stacked up. When the days and hours and minutes and God had seen that in history, he knew exactly where that was going to happen in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And in Ephesians chapter 5, I want to focus here a little bit because this is the scripture that talks to us about how we begin to qualify the use of time in our own lives. The Apostle Paul is writing to new believers, the church of Ephesus. He's talked to them about the fact they've turned from their idols. They've come to Christ. They have experienced all of God's goodness. They have known forgiveness. They are children of God. And the chapters preceding that talk all about that. But they had something yet lacking in their faith. And the Apostle Paul begins to talk to them about the need to go on in their faith to be filled with the Spirit. And he's beginning to describe what the Spirit-filled life would, might look like as he comes to chapter 5. And he comes down to chapter 5, verse 15, and here are the instructions that begin this whole paragraph that goes clear over into chapter 6, that begins to talk to us about the need to be filled with the Spirit so that out of the fullness of the Spirit in our lives, certain behaviors begin to become the norm. And one of those has to do with the way we use our time in the Spirit-filled life. Notice what he says here, be very careful then. 
how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And then he talks in the next phrase, verse 16, about our time. But not the chronos time. The kairos time. Making the most of every opportunity, as the translation here says, or making the most of the seasons, or making the most, having a discernment about what God's doing at any given moment in the seasons of life in the world that we live in. Why do we do this? Paul said, because... If you don't, you're going to get sucked in by all the confusion and the corruption and the evil and and the half-truths that the culture, and you'll constantly be be stirred up and upset by all of the stuff that's going around you in the culture because the days are evil. You need to seize the seasons and see what God's doing in the seasons of your life at this very moment. Now, how do we begin to apply this? Well, One of the most helpful things, and I shared this at at different times, and some of you may have heard me share this in some places, but but I always keep coming back to this at least once a year because I need it. If you don't, I need this in my life. It, It is the work of Stephen Covey, and many of you have studied him in business situations. Maybe you've been in seminars. Your corporations have used him. He's been used a lot. He, he wrote a book called First Things First. And he establishes a wonderful basic model of how we begin to use our time. And the premise is this. And I've put it in your notes. You must, we must, I must move beyond time management to what he calls life leadership. What he's saying is, we must move beyond chronos to begin to think about kairos. And he goes ahead to put it this way, that is, we must take charge of our lives before we can take charge of our time. That's a profound statement. How do you do that? Well, he talks in terms of two images. The clock and a compass. I'm going to add to that. I want to add to that the clock, the compass, and a gyroscope. And talk about the ways in which those control our lives. The clock represents our commitments, your job schedule, your appointments, your schedules. These are the things that control us from the outside. You get up every morning, you go through a routine, and you go to work and you check in and you, you're there for a particular time or you log into your computer if you're working from home and you go through this process and there's this routine that you have to follow. There's some jobs that have to be done and this is the routine every morning, every morning, every day, every day, week after week after week after week. This is what we call making a living. It's the clock. And many times we become victims of our schedules and our commitments. And we begin to feel like, and if, and, and if this is all you're doing is a nine to five job and following through on a schedule, I guarantee you at some point in time, you're going to start feeling like, what in the world is life all about? This is routine and this is boring. Do I have to go to work one more morning? I'd just love it if I didn't. Have, man, it'd be great to retire. And then I retire and I wish I had something to do. And we just live by this clock. All the time in our lives. And it controls us. And then when it controls us, eventually we feel like we're out of control. It doesn't work. On the other hand, Stephen Covey says there's a compass. And the compass represents our values. It represents the vision. It represents kind of the kairos time that the Bible talks about. It represents our principles. It represents our conscience because with our conscience, we choose what is good, better, best. I was in a furniture store the other day trying to shop for some furniture and they have these signs. You ever been in a furniture store recently, a homemaker someplace in there? They have these signs. You can go down the aisle and they say, hey, good, then they have one sitting by it that's better. And then they have another piece of furniture just like it, except they say it's better. 
Well, you pick it up and figure out what, what, what's better. Well, one of them is made out of a better wood, and one of them's made out of something else, and a better finish, and a better construction, and a few more pieces in it. This is what we're talking about here with the, the conscience, the compass. I make choices, not just about what is good and bad, but what is better and best in our lives. But I want to talk to you also about the gyroscope, because what I discover is this. A lot of people are not controlled just by the clock, but they're controlled by an inner gyroscope that represents the internal, hidden, emotional centers of what you might call the subconscious mind out of which we live And we're not even really conscious of what's driving us. We do things, we react to things, but we don't know why. It's the gyroscope that works inside of us. And we choose rather than the clock or even even the compass of our lives. It's the gyroscope that drives us and controls both our compass and our clock. And many times gets us into a lot of trouble. Because then we live reactive lifestyles. We never think through anything. We don't feel like we have any choices. We're just reacting constantly to the stimuli around us. It's the emotional inner gyroscope that has no values. And it just reacts to whatever's happening. And most of us at some point in our lives have to deal with a gap between the compass and the clock and the gyroscope. What really drives your decisions? What really drives your use of time? Stephen Covey says that in order to begin to bring this together, I have to determine and discover what is true north in our lives. Now, you know that a compass has a magnet in it, and it works and draws the needle to the true north. So that when you hold the compass, it's always pointing the needle toward the true north. It's calibrated to true north in our lives. Well, how do we get to true north? Well, we have to identify what are the essential values of our life. And in Covey's terms, the way he talks about it is this. I have to decide that the first things remain the first things in my life. He uses an interesting phrase. You've probably heard this. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't it be great if we could all keep the main thing as the main thing in our lives? Well, what is the main thing? What is the compass in your life? Where is true north? How does that differ from the culture as a Christian? What is your true north? Who's going to calibrate your compass? Who is really in charge of your calendar and your life and your values and your choices in your life? Who is is infiltrating that with input that gives you a center, a true north? Well, I want to suggest to you that the Bible doesn't leave us hanging here with this. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, and let's look at the rest of the verse. Making the most of every kairos because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, Paul talking to his culture, and he might as well be talking to our culture. Do not be drunk with wine. You know what he's saying? Some people live their whole lives so can't wait to get through the work week so we can get to Friday night. I finished up my work in the office complex in a different place across town on Friday night. I got out kind of late. I, I noticed that all the pubs, the parking lots are jammed. It's Friday night. <laughs> Wasn't like that every other night. There were a few cars. Jim, they're parking everywhere on the street. Everybody's going in on Friday night. We can, you know what? 
And we live in a culture in which everybody can hardly wait to get done with the headache of the day so I can get home and get my glass of wine. And then it becomes two and three and four. And pretty soon I have to have a whole bunch of wine. And that's what Paul's culture was like too. And he says, don't be, that, 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 the compass is not calibrated. You're, you're going to miss true north. In fact, you're setting yourself up for addictions and for difficulties in your family. And our culture has proven that over and over and over again. I don't have to prove those statistics of the misuse and the abuse of alcohol in our culture. And Paul says that, that that lifestyle of using time is going to lead to debauchery. That means waste, destruction in your life. Instead, Paul says, trade spirits. <laughs> Instead of chasing the spirits, let's, let's go to the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, be filled with the Spirit. And the word filled is, is in the tense in the Greek that, that means you're not doing the filling. There's something else or someone else doing the filling. But the implication is you have to allow it. You have to give permission for it. You have to receive it. You have to say, come on in. I accept this. You have a part, but God does the filling with His Spirit. You don't fill yourself with God's Spirit. You just simply say, I open my life, fill me with your Spirit, Lord. And He does it. He's promised to do that. Faithful and just who has called us will also do that. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to write to the Galatians about what you do in this lifestyle. He says, live in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You won't live in the gyroscope of the emotions if you let the Spirit start healing and moving you to maturity and wholeness in Christ. You'll stop thinking like children. You'll, you, you won't be living in what do I think and what do I want and, and what's, what do I think's best for me. But you begin to live in the Spirit. And when we live by the Spirit, Paul says, let us then make that a daily ongoing moment. And, and, and the interesting tense here is imperfect in the Greek. And it means don't ever stop. Just keep on going, ongoing, ongoing, keeping in step. And the word for keeping in step is the, as you've heard me say before, is the Greek word that describes a marching band or soldiers mar marching in formation. Keep in step with the Spirit. Could I suggest to you this morning from this, from the Word of God, that true north is learning to live in the life of the Holy Spirit. That's true north. Now, when you begin to live in the Spirit, there's some unique things that's going to flow out of that. And, and there are four characteristics that, that are going to become a recovery of the image of God in you. You are created in the image of God with four characteristics that get all messed up by the gyroscope, the emotional reactive system, or it gets all messed up by you becoming a slave to schedules and clocks and will take you off a of due north and you won't have a compass. The four characteristics are self-awareness, the ability to be aware, who I am, what God wants in my life. The conscience will develop. Some of you struggle to know what's right. What's the best thing for me to do? Because you've never really developed what it is to live in the spirit with true north in your life. And so you're constantly making decisions by indecision. Or you let other people make the decisions. And then you're angry about the decisions that are made for you. Because it isn't what you chose. And it isn't what you wanted. But you have lived in indecision all your life. The third one is independent will, the ability to use the God-given will. The most powerful force in the universe is your will that God has given you to exercise for His glory. And then the creative imagination. Creative imagination. Brother Richard talked about this very thing, created an image of God a few weeks ago when he began to ask you, what is, what is it that God might be asking you to do? Use your creative imagination. What is God might be asking you to do in ministry? And you know what? We've had some marvelous responses to that. 
I read a proposal last night. I'm excited about what's coming off. There's, there's one in your bulletin today. There's a, there, there's a beginning. You're going to see it begin to introduce next week. And then it's going to have an opportunity for some of you. God's going to call you to this ministry that is developing right now in obedience. Somebody is being obedient to God. And in February, you're going to see this ministry roll out. And some of you are going to be a part of that. God's going to ask you to do that. There's some other ministry that's coming down the road that I'm excited about. I can hardly wait to tell you about it. As a part of obeying God as we move into the new building, that's the creative imagination. That's what life in the Spirit begins to look at. And we begin to discover what is truly valuable. And when we do, there's four things that then begins to flow out of our life. We really begin to live. It gets fun. I'm not just making a living and punching a clock from nine to five. There is something that has a purpose. It's going somewhere. There is living, caring for our physical needs. There is loving that cares for the social needs. There's the learning and where we care about what's going on with our mental needs in our lives. And we begin to leave a legacy. We give attention to the spiritual needs that has eternal purpose and value. And suddenly we got true north and all the rest of the chronos begins to come in line with the kairos in our lives. And when we begin to operate in our eternal compass, rather than the external calendar or, or the emotional gyroscope, then we begin to be able to evaluate our lives. And one of the ways we do that, Stephen Covey uses this, and I've found it very helpful in my own life. And, and when I get alone with God every so often, and I do it at the first of the year, in fact, this week I'll be doing some of this, because I didn't get to do it last week. I'll get to sit down a little bit, the Lord willing, and I'm going to spend some time evaluating what needs to happen in my life. And I'm going to not just do it in my own thinking, but I'm asking the Holy Spirit of God who lives in me to begin to help me to see where my time is being used. So we have this little, this little diagram. And I put it on your notes. You can fill it in. Quadrant run. Urgent and important. And then we talk about the non-urgent, quadrant two, but important. And the quadrant three is the urgent, but not important. Quadrant four is not urgent and not important. Now let's look at that with just a moment. There's a lot of us that live our lives much of the time in quadrant one. Urgent and important. You say, well, that sounds like a very important thing. Well, it can be, but here's how this works. We never deal with the important until the last minute when it becomes urgent. If you're struggling with procrastination, you're in quadrant run. You know what's important, the exam you have to take, the tax deadline that's coming up, you know what's important, but you wait till the night before to do it. And suddenly, the important becomes urgent and is always crisis. And if you're living in quadrant run, you're living from one crisis to the next crisis to the next crisis to the next crisis. And you never have to, time to sit down and think about what's really important because you're just responding to the next crisis. Now, unless you have a photographic mind, and I had a friend in college, he would, he would never even buy the textbooks till the last day of class, till the day before. And, and literally, it made me so mad. He'd go buy the textbook, or he'd borrow, that's what he'd do, he wouldn't even buy it. He'd go borrow somebody's textbook a couple of days before the final exam, and he'd read through it very quickly, and in his mind worked like a photograph, photographic mind, they call it. And it would just take a picture of every page. <laughs> and he literally went through college with straight 4.00 and never bought a textbook and took all the exams. Don't you wish you had that kind of mind? Now, unless you have that kind of mind, most of us have to study. 
Most of us have to do the paper. Lisa loved to used to do her, when I was dating her in college, she loved to wait till the night before to write the final paper. Now, I, 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 that would drive me nuts. And she'd work all night long. And she did very well. She got the A's. But she was always living in crisis. I, I learned early on that my stomach couldn't handle that. <laughs> I needed to study with that. But the quadrant one. And sometimes we find ourselves in this, in this quadrant of crisis, pressing problems and deadlines, and you never really feel like you get downtime because you're always responding to the crisis in your life. There's some of us that live in quadrant four, where things are neither urgent nor important. And in fact, we don't, we don't bother with that much. And it gets us into trouble. We live in the trivia of life. We live in the busy work. We live in the junk mail. We live in phone calls. I read recently that most, the average person in America will spend two years of their lifetime on the phone. <laughs> in minutes and hours. Two years. Sometimes this involves television shows and computer games, all the stuff that we do. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are times for you where, you, where your mind needs to just zone out and you need to relax, and there's a time for all of these. But some of us live in this quadrant all of the time or most of the time in our lives. And in quadrant three, there's times in which we have the urgent, but it's not important. So we're always dealing with what everybody else thinks is important for me to do. So I'm always responding to everybody else's demands. And I never have time to think about the important. This is the interruptions that you deal with. This is the meaningless meetings that some of you go to all the time. It's some, some of the mail. It might be some other things in your life where you're struggling with popular activities and entertainment where you're just sitting waiting to be entertained. Now, if you're going to begin to develop a spirit-filled response to time that sees Kronos in the context of the compass and Kairos, then it's important for us to begin to understand that quadrant two, two might represent that, where we begin to look at quadrant two and we see the, the process of that where we live with some of our life, at least not in the urgent, but we have time to look at the important. The activities of preparation. The activities of devotions and quiet time. Spending time with God. Listening. The, the intentional place in our schedule where it doesn't matter what else is happening. I make time to connect with people in my life so that I can build relationships. Lisa and I have some people in our lives. We lay every thigh and cancel the thing almost once a week without fail because we need to build relationships. There is something about that process. It's where we value, our, we clarify our values. It's where we enter into recreation that truly is recreative and not sitting and being entertained. It's where we become active with our minds and our bodies that truly creates recreation that has value and purpose. Now all of us live in this particular area and we could, we could talk more about that. And don't, misunder, don't misinterpret the urgency for importance in our lives. The importance, urgency does come. There comes a point of urgency. But do you flow out of the inner, in urgency or do you spend time in the important in your life? Here's, here's one of the ways that I've learned to do this. When I begin to feel lots and lots of pressure in the time... I'll sit down many times in my devotional life. Important. This week I fought for that. It didn't come easy this week. Some weeks it does. But I fought for every single morning because the demands were so great. I fought for that. But I spend time with this and I say, 
I, I lay all this out in the schedule and I say, if I don't get this done, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? What's the consequence? And the Holy Spirit begins to guide me in some of those areas of my life. And the answer to that question then puts the activities and the important and urgency into perspective. Does this really have to be done? Is this, is this, is this going to be the most important thing I do today? And, and many times I say it that way. I say, Lord, what's the most important thing that I need to do today? If nothing else gets done, what's the most important thing that you're in that I need to get done today? And it's amazing where he begins to guide in that area. And suddenly the pressure's off. And we begin to learn how to deal with that in our lives. And we begin to find the compass of what's true north. Now, what happens if we don't learn this? Well, then some things happen. If you live, if you live in the urgent and the important things get done poorly, then you're going to experience some low effectiveness and you're going to feel like nothing's ever done efficient. And the fact is, if you're living in the urgent all the time, you're probably not doing your best work because you haven't given your whole mind to it. If you're doing important things poorly, there may be some immediate high effectiveness, but in the end, it becomes less effective. Let me show you how that works. If you're living in the important things and practicing and preparing and practicing and preparing, then you can fail a whole bunch of times in the practice and still not hurt the end result of what needs to happen in your life. The fact is, you get time to practice so that by the time you get to the urgent where it's time to use it, you have practiced and failed and practiced and failed and practiced till you can do it without failure and you do it with confidence. There isn't an athlete alive who has done, there isn't a musician, an athlete, who's ever done, become great in their talent the first time they did it. There's a process that has to happen. You want to be a mature Christian? Then you're going to have to set the habit down. You can't do that overnight. You want to get control of your emotional life? You can't do that with one visit to the psychologist or a little pill over here, take some medication. It's going to take some re redoing and reevaluation of the gyroscope and put the true north in place and begin to let God bring everything into balance into the character of Jesus Christ. Practice. And so we have to learn to put it all together so that we can get to the place that God the Holy Spirit gets our best because we've given him our best and we allow him to work in our lives. Now, I want to close this morning with a couple of, of illustrations from Scripture because I see this in the life of Jesus and I see this in others, but especially the Apostle Paul. When we read... Well, I put on the screen a map of Jesus' um, journeys. And uh, this is just one of those journeys. I've had a map in the back of my Bible, and I couldn't find that, where there's a whole bunch of trips in his three years. And it looks like he was a schizophrenic. He didn't know where he's going. If you look at his map of his life. In fact, there's a little bit of that here. It looks just like he can't figure out where he's supposed to be. <laughs> and you think, and then you start reading verses like this. And the Spirit led Jesus into the desert. The Spirit did? To fast for 40 days. The temptation? The Spirit led Jesus into the fast so that he would experience temptation? The Spirit did that? That's what the Bible says. So Jesus was led of the Spirit in his own life as a human being. And what we begin to see is, is that Jesus was in touch with not just Kronos, but he had to in three years. He only had three years. He had to be in touch with Kairos. And he knew his mission. So look at, look at John chapter 7. Here's, here's an interesting uh, situation that took place in Jesus' life. You remember he's... Uh, 
getting toward the end of his ministry, the end of the three years, and they're getting ready to go up to the Jewish festival of shelters or booths or whatever you call it. In the Old Testament, it was what Jews did every year. And they're getting ready to go to the festival, and Jesus had brothers by now. Mary had had other children. And he's having a discussion with the brothers, and they're talking about when they're leaving for the festival in Jerusalem. And, and in, in chapter 7, verse 1, look at this with me. After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time, Kronos, for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brothers said to him, hey, Jesus, let's go. Go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you're hiding out in a small little hick town like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. Go to New York. Let's do it. But his brothers were living on Kronos and the gyroscope of emotion and not Kairos. For the verse 5 says his brothers didn't believe him. <laughs> you ever had your family not believe in you and your faith in Christ and persecute you and make fun of you because of your faith? Jesus knows what that feels like. His own brothers. And Jesus replied, verse 6, Now is not the right time, kairos, not time. Oh, it's time for the festival, but it's not time for me to go. You guys, because you're living on the chronos, you can go anytime you want. But when you're living in the spirit, you don't go anytime you want. You live in the kairos of the spirit. And then it says, the world can't hate you, but it does. Why can't the world hate them? Because they're living in the chronos like everybody else. They're part of the crowd. They're part of the culture. They're just immersed into the culture. Jesus is outside the culture. He, he's in the culture, but he's above culture. He is greater than the culture. He's living in Kairos time. And he says, but it does hate me. Because I accuse it of doing evil. You guys go on. You go live in your chronos time. Keep your clock. Don't be late. It's starting tomorrow. Get there on time. You want to get the best lamb chops. You got to get there early. <laughs> if you want to build your booth and have the, the, the nice palm branches. The best of the best that's been shipped in. You better get over there early. Get your booth built. But don't be late. Because chronos time is what you're living on. But I'm not coming. And after saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. But after his brothers left for the festival, Jesus also, yeah, he eventually went up. Though secretly, staying out of. The public. Why? Because he's living in Cairo's time. He said, it's not my time yet. He knew the crucifixion was imminent once he gets out there and becomes public. We're going to have a big old mess on our hands. And Jesus said, it's not time yet in our lives. I wonder, have you experienced that in your life? Being led of the Spirit, tuned in to Kairos time, or are you just living by the clock and the calendar? The Apostle Paul was a little bit different. In fact, when you get a map of his journeys, this is just one of the three journeys that he took. You see how organized that is? I mean, he's going places. And the Apostle Paul, trained as a Greek, university education, Paul was to the point. Now notice the difference. Jesus applied Kairos time differently. But they were both being led of the Spirit. But Paul organizes his. 
And there's nothing wrong with organizing your time and deciding where we're going to do, and we'll do this today and tomorrow and that and the other. And, and some of you do that, and you do that very well. And that's how the world runs, and you have to know some of this. And so Paul puts this all together, and he goes, he goes all over the place, and he's sharing the gospel, and he's, he's being led of the Spirit. Except something happened up here, right up here, right about here. He's on this journey. He's got all his plans. He's got a calendar. He's got it all together. This is what we're going to do. Luke, this is what we're doing. Get it in your calendar, your Google account. Make sure it's in there. Don't miss this. We're going into Bithynia. That's where we're going. Oh, well, wait a minute. The line doesn't go there. What happened? Well, Acts chapter 16 tells us. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Watch this. But having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When we came to the border of Myasia, we tried to enter Bithynia because that was on the calendar. But the Spirit of Jesus, don't miss that. The Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there. Someone wrote me this week and said, If you want to make God smile, give him your schedule and tell him your plans. <laughs> You ever done that? <laughs> and they went down to Troas. And then the Holy Spirit really messed it up. He really messed with their schedule. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after we'd seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Can we go back to that map? Now, now, I want you to see this. This is the scripture. They wanted to go up here. The Spirit of Jesus said, uh-uh. Kairos time. It's not time yet. Somebody else is going to do that, Paul, not you. I want you to go over here. And then they had this vision. He had a dream in the middle of the night. And said, I want you to jump the pond and get on over here. And you know what kind of ministry they had over here? Thessalonica, Philippi. Wow. Yeah, Ephesus. Oh, that was, that was the messed up schedule. But when you read the New Testament, when you read the New Testament, what are the letters that become inspired scripture? Ephesus, Philippi. <laughs> Did God know what he was doing? Yeah. Did they finally get to Asia? Yeah, we're having great revival in Asia, even to this current day. God has sent missionaries, but not Paul. And then one more from Jesus' life. John chapter 4, Jesus is traveling around. And um, he's being led of the Spirit. And in chapter 4, there's this really strange phrase in the Bible. It says, verse 3, so Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now, here's how the Jews go from Judea to Galilee. Galilee's up here. Jews down here. There's this land in here called Samaria where the half-breeds live. Half Jew, half Samaritan has a whole history of ethnic garbage going on, racism and all that stuff. No Jew ever goes through Samaria. Ever. You take the long way around to stay out of the half-breed country to get up to Galilee. Don't ever go through Samaria if you're a Jew. That was the way you lived. If you're smart, you just stay out of there. Don't go downtown Chicago. <laughs> I did that late one night with my whole family. My wife won't let me forget it. I mean, locking your doors and keeping your windows up didn't feel safe. Don't go through it. 
But Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. And th 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 this blows my mind. And he had to go through Samaria. Well, who said? What kind of creepy stuff is this? Who? Oh, you, suicide note? What are you doing, Jesus? And, and, the, and the Greek makes this really strange because it's in the imperfect tense again that means he couldn't get it, he couldn't avoid it. He was so impressed with the fact, I must not go the normal way, I got to go this way. <laughs> And he couldn't get away from it. It just kept, have you ever had the spirit just bug you until you, it was the stupidest, craziest thing you ever heard of in your life. But the, it was impressed upon you that I need to do this. Something happens. And guess what happened? Shows up at a well and he encounters a hurting woman who's been married Four times and she's living with her living lover. And she's coming out to the well at the worst time of day. When nobody else would be there because she's so embarrassed by her lifestyle. <laughs> and a Jew shows up and talks to a Samaritan. Not just a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. That's two strikes against Jesus in the Jewish culture. And he has a conversation with her, ends up back at her village. They have this marvelous revival meeting and a whole bunch of people get saved. Because Jesus was living on Kairos time. And not the gyroscope emotion of his culture. And not the clock. He didn't save any time getting to Galilee. He spent more time getting to Galilee. What does this look like? It doesn't always feel good. I was aware of this this week. It's funny how the Lord uses stuff when you're preparing messages. <laughs> I have a full schedule. I've made commitments months in advance. Somebody contacts me and says, could you meet at a particular place in a particular meeting? And normally I would say, and I did. I said, well, I won't be able to do that. Let's do the next week. And it came back. Is there any way you could do it this week? And I'm going, oh, man, I'm good for this. <sighs> Quiet time in the morning. Lord, <laughs> that's important. They're both important. Now what am I going to do? I got a conflict. What do you want me to do here? And the Spirit said, Carve out time from the other commitments, but don't miss this appointment. So I did. And the people we were supposed to meet with got sick. <laughs> and they couldn't meet when I scheduled it. And I went out of my way to schedule it. And they wanted it for two days past that on another day at the same time. Now I have to reschedule the whole thing again and tell somebody else, oh, can I do it? <laughs> Kairos time. And the Spirit said, don't miss the appointment. And so I rearranged the schedule again because the Spirit said, don't miss that appointment. So I got to that appointment. I sat and listened to someone in our community who has been doing a ministry for 12 years. That's incredible. I don't know if we'll partner with them or not. I don't know what will happen with that. But I began to realize it's a Kairos moment. And we're talking. And she finally says, well, tell me about, about your church and what you're doing. So we told her about church, told her about life skills, we told her about what we're doing, the building we bought, and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, I saw her whole face light up. And she said, I don't know if it would ever work. But she says, our ministry is out of room. And we desperately have to move by August. And we need a new place. And we need to be able to spread out and even have a place for child care because part of our ministries is some child care throughout the week. And I begin to describe a playground on the back side of our building and the potential of space. 
And all of a sudden, Kairos moment. Now, I don't know if that will ever materialize. Because it may not be about her being in our building. It may be about the ministry she's doing that we part with in some other ways. God knows that process. And then she said to me, why are you here? <laughs> she says, most pastors wouldn't come to this kind of appointment. <laughs> That's probably true. They have so many invitations like that, they wouldn't have done it. But the Spirit said, don't miss that appointment. I still don't know what that's all about, but I sense that I've been in Kairos time. And God's doing something big. And what he's doing. Could I ask you a question this morning? Do you know that you've passed from death unto life and that you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ? Do you know that the Spirit dwells in you? Have you done that? If you haven't, then you'll never understand Kairos time in the spirit. You'll never understand life in the spirit because Jesus said, if you don't have the spirit, you're none of mine. Where Jesus is invited, the spirit moves in. You could simply ask Jesus to be master, savior, leader, and Lord of your life this morning. He would come in and begin this, this growth and maturity process in your life of bringing your clock and your gyroscope emotionally and healing you and bringing that all into balance with your true north compass in the spirit. And here's what I ask you. You say, I'm a believer. I've confessed my sins. I know I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and I'm trying to live a Christian life. Could I ask you a question this morning? Have you been filled with the spirit? I didn't ask you if you have the spirit. I ask you if you've been filled with the spirit. Well, what would that look like, Pastor? It would simply be going back to Jesus and say, look, I see there's something inside of me that keeps arguing and fussing and resistant to the leadership of God in my life. And I can't seem to do it, take care of that. Every time I try, I try to do better. But there's a resistance inside of me I can't explain. I want to do God's will, but I want to do it my way. And you become aware of this over a period of time. That's what Paul's talking about in the Ephesians. They were believers, but they had never been filled with God's Spirit. And here's how you do that. You say, Lord, I can't fix what's inside of me that's resistant to you. But here's what I can do. I bring all that I have and all that I'm not and all of my gifts and all of my talents and all of my failures and everything else and I surrender it fully to you. Clean up what you can't use. Move aside. Destroy what you can't use. Salvage, redeem, and fill and empower me with what you can find that's usable in your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. I give you my all. Now don't do that unless you mean it. Because guess what? When you say that. There's going to be a building permit pulled on your life right there. And the sawhorses are going to come out. And the tools are going to come out. And the wires are going to be messed with and everything in your brain and everything in your whole being the Holy Spirit's going to take you seriously and you're going to be under construction like you've never been under construction before he's going to start messing with the gyroscope in your life he's going to start messing with your clock he's going to start messing with your priorities and your calendars he's going to start messing with your appetites he's going to start messing with your hobbies he's going to start messing with your entertainment habits he's going to start messing with everything to bring it in to conformity, to true north, to Jesus Christ.
I've heard people say, when, I, when, when the Spirit filled me up, life seemed to get worse for a while. Yeah, it will, probably will. You ever been under construction? Remodel job in your house? You think it never end. That's what he does. But it'll have a Kairos purpose. Would you let him do that?